Good afternoon. My name is Cameron McElhenney, and I serve as the Director of Training and Education for the National Association for Civilian Oversight of Law Enforcement. I'd like to th welcome all of you to NACL's 2018 webinar series, where today we'll be discussing the pros and cons of having law enforcement in our classrooms. Before I turn things over to today's facilitator, I'd like to go over a few things regarding today's call. During the webinar, all attendees will be muted. As soon as we begin, however, you will have the ability to type in any questions you might have for Professor Scootin Kagan or Professor Stoughton. When we come to the question and answer portion of the webinar, your questions will be asked and answered as they have been received. During the webinar, you may also send any questions you might have for me as the webinar administrator in the same manner, and I will answer your questions as quickly as possible. At the conclusion of the webinar, each of you will be given the opportunity to complete a brief survey on today's event. If you could please take a few moments to complete this survey, it will help us as we move forward with enhancing and expanding our webinar series. With our housekeeping duties out of the way, I would like to introduce you to today's facilitator, Julie Ruin, a principal with the OIR group and a longtime member of NACOL and the Training, Education, and Standards Committee. Julie? Thank you, Cami. Um, do I have control of the screen now, Cami? Yeah, it's headed your way. Got it. Well, welcome everyone. Thank you for being with us today. My name is Julie Rulin. In our work in various jurisdictions, we have seen the presence of local law enforcement officers in schools generate controversies and community concerns in a number of different ways, from uses of force to disproportionate targeting of students of color. And we have increasingly been called upon to address these issues. The concept of school resource officers, or SROs, as we'll call them today, has some attractive upsides, from the perception of the need for increased security on campuses, to the idea that SROs have the opportunity to engage in a model of community policing and build po positive relationships with young people. But there are contrary viewpoints about the implications of police in a school setting, and concerns that the public safety benefits of a police presence are outweighed by patterns in enforcement that mirror some of the larger issues we see playing out in the national dialogue on policing. To discuss all of this today, we have two law professors who have researched and written on the topic. Seth Stoughton is an assistant professor at the University of South Carolina School of Law. His scholarship focuses on the regulation of police, including police community relations and the use of force. He is a frequent lecturer on policing issues and regularly appears on national and international media. Seth uh, served as an officer with the Tallahassee Police Department for five years. After leaving the PD in 2005, he spent three years as an investigator in the Florida Department of Education's Office of Inspector General. He then attended the University of Virginia School of Law, served as a law clerk on the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals, and was a fellow and lecturer at Harvard Law School before joining the faculty at the University of South Carolina. Josh Gupta Kagan is a colleague of Seth's as an assistant professor at the University of South Carolina School of Law. He specializes in juvenile justice and child welfare and teaches the juvenile justice clinic at the law school where he supervises third year law students representing teenagers accused of delinquent acts in family court, cases that often involve incidents arising at school. He is a graduate of Yale College, the New York University School of Law, and he clerked for the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit. Josh has published frequently, and one article analyzes reforms pursued in the wake of the high-profile 2015 incident between an SRO and a high school student at the Spring Valley High School in Columbia, South Carolina, which we'll talk uh, a little more about later on in the webinar. Um, before we dive right into our discussion, um, Cami said that uh, you could type in questions, and I want to um, encourage you to, to feel free to post those questions as we go. This will give me a chance to see how many questions we have coming in, so I can try to judge the amount of time I need to hold at the end to make sure that we answer everyone's questions. With all of those introductions, um, I'd like to just start by asking the professors to talk about some of the ways in which SROs contribute to the school environment and uh, the potential upsides of having officers in schools. Hi, well, everyone. Yeah, go ahead, Josh. <laughs> okay. Uh, um, 
this, this is Josh, um, Seth and I are not in the same room, obviously. So we, the historical way that SROs were talked about are, are as a triad. They're supposed to be a law enforcement officer to help keep schools safe, right? Um, anytime there's been a mass shooting at school, as happens all too often, as everyone knows, one thing that folks can agree on, or uh, across the political aisles at least, is that SROs may be helpful. Um, SRO, the number of SROs spiked when juvenile crime was more than double what it is today back in the early 90s. Um, but that's, the law enforcement roles are only one of the, the three main areas. The SROs are supposed to also be counselors and educators. That's the traditional uh, traditional model. The idea is they can build good relationships with students, help counsel them, and maybe even prevent crime going forward and, and improve police community relationships. That's the theory. Hi everyone, this is Seth, and uh, I apologize, uh, my phone is awfully staticky, although I'm told that that is not coming across uh, in what you hear, so if I suddenly flake out, it is not intentional on my part. Um, I don't have much to add uh, from what uh, Josh suggested there, the, the triad of the SRO role. Um, a survey of SROs themselves, a relatively small group of SROs, but a survey of SROs uh, identified not just those roles, but also what the SROs described as being surrogate parents to the kids at the schools that they served in. Um, this is, I think, a little more uh, personal than the uh, more formalized role of a, a counselor, a mentor, or educator, um, and is also worth uh, adding into part of that discussion. So there is a question about uh, safety. I think the assumption is that uh, police officers are going to make schools more safe, but the evidence is maybe not so clear on that. Josh? Yeah, so the, the Congressional Research Service, which is a nonpartisan group, accumulated a lot of all the studies that have been done as of a few years ago when they, when they did a report, and they concluded what we don't actually know if SROs make campuses um, safer and after the not the last, the second to last mass shooting that gathered lots of national attention in, 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 uh, in Florida. There was, of course, a lot of attention about the role of the SRO there. He obviously didn't, regardless of whether the SRO did what he should have done in the instant, uh, in the instance, the gunman wasn't deterred, right, by that, uh, by, by the presence of the SRO. There were a couple other incidents where there may be evidence that someone was deterred and chose a slightly different target. But in terms of studying this empirically, it's really hard to say SROs make campus safer from those types of events. As bad as those events are, the good thing we can say is that they're still rare and school is generally still a very safe place for kids to be. Um, folks have also studied, academics have studied whether SRO presence makes um, schools safer from crime um, generally, and here we have conflicting studies. Some um, studies find really no impact whatsoever. A few positive, more positive studies suggest what SRO presence might lead to fewer incidents of gun crime. Maybe a kid will think twice about bringing a weapon to school if they know there's an officer there. It would be the theory. But again, and that ha that's in one or two studies. It's not in the bulk of studies. It's really hard to conclude that that's, uh, you know, you add an SRO to your school that you're going to make your school safer. It's also important to think about the mechanism by which SROs are believed to improve school safety, right? So if, if that's the goal, if the goal is improving school safety, how exactly do SROs do that? Uh, one method that Josh mentioned may be deterrence. Someone who is going to cause a problem or uh, 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 start a violent incident at a school, engage in a school shooting or something like that, may be deterred by the presence of the SRO. Um, Although not every school shooting has been at a school that has had an SRO, most of them have. Um, sometimes not a full-time SRO stationed at that school, sometimes an SRO who goes between several schools. Uh, and, and school shootings are still statistically rare enough that it's really difficult to identify whether there would be more um, with more SROs or not. But what we know is the ones that do occur certainly do not appear to have been deterred uh, by the, the presence of a, or potential presence of an SRO. Another mechanism may be um, addressing 
um, criminal or violent behavior within the school itself, right? So uh, assuming an incident isn't going to be deterred, assuming an offender isn't going to be deterred by the presence of an SRO, maybe the SRO can bring that event to a, uh, a faster and more successful conclusion. Um, and uh, here too, it's really difficult to say with any um, degree of uh, uh, accuracy uh, that SROs have a measurable difference across incidents, right? Any one incident, the SRO may be in the right place in the right time. In another incident, the SRO may be one of the last personnel on the school grounds to respond to a particular incident. Um, here, we might draw a parallel to mass shooting incidents more generally, some of which the police do um, step in, intervene, and uh, uh, address. The vast majority of which, however, are complete well before the, the police ever get involved. That's not just true in the, in, the, in the context of mass shootings. It's actually true in the context of most criminal behavior. Uh, and I don't think we have any good reason to believe that the SRO is going to be meaningfully different in that regard. Um, another uh, set of studies focused not just on SRO, but on uh, armed security, regardless of whether they were sworn officers or not. One of the interesting um, uh, results from, from those studies that have public policy implications is uh, the potential for the presence of an SRO or armed security uh, to, to increase crime, not increase the actual underlying behaviors, the prevalence of particular behaviors, but instead uh, to respond to those incidents in a law enforcement oriented way, which looks like, because now we're getting more behaviors reported and dealt with as crimes, looks like it actually increases crime. So in addition to thinking about the mechanisms, we also need to think about the reporting and the, and the, the sort of source or the context of the available data. Can we move on and talk about some of the other contributions and potential upsides um, of SRO programs in schools? Yeah, I, I'll, I'll start with the one that tends to um, take center stage as law enforcement officials are talking about SRO programs beyond the idea of safety. And that's um, building positive connections with uh, community members, particularly juveniles and especially um, juveniles in minority populations. Uh, a number of these kids, the belief is, um, live in environments uh, where uh, the adults that they're around, adult family members, uh, older relatives, may not have had a lot of positive or any positive relationships, positive interactions with police. And the uh, ability of an SRO to build early on in a child's life a positive relationship is viewed as one of the long-term mechanisms through which law enforcement hopes to um, really uh, help overcome some of uh, what can be a fairly fractured uh, uh, relationship. It's sort of an early way to start bridging that divide. And what about uh, the role of an SRO as an educator in terms of educating them on law enforcement matters and do we have a sense of how effective they are at that? I'll jump in with a, a uh, not very. Um, <laughs> uh, the, and that's not to say that SROs are worse than anyone else. I think it is to say that the education programs to which they are assigned, like you're going to teach the middle school dare class SRO, um, or you're going to talk to kids about what happens when a police officer stops you, right? Um, those don't have a particular strong evidence base. DARE is sort of a great example of a program that is around and feels good, but there's very little reason to, to think that it actually does it achieves any of its goals. It's, one of, it's been studied a few different times and hard to say that it actually decre decreases the number of kids who choose to use drugs later on. Um, though if those are the sorts of education programs we ask SROs to, to, to engage in, they're, pro they're 
we shouldn't expect them to be any more effective than anyone else. It also worth pointing out that we might expect them to be less effective at um, education than um, other personnel, other teachers, other educators in that environment. Uh, because most SROs do not have any sort of formal training in pedagogy, in uh, teaching effectively. Um, so they tend to use the method of instruction that they have been exposed to as officers. And unfortunately, a significant amount of police training also isn't based on effective pedagogy. So they, end, uh, they, they lecture, they maybe show some videos. Um, but even, uh, uh, even with a, a, a solid curriculum, which as Josh pointed out, we really don't have any evidence that it exists or has ever really existed. Uh, even with a solid curriculum for SROs to follow, it's not clear that they would be the most effective educators uh, on, on the various topics. And to piggyback on that and to tie it to a point Seth made earlier, if one of the goals is to improve community re police relations, especially in communities of color. If you bring in a police officer or an SRO and you try to teach kids, okay, what to do if you're stopped? How to do that is incredibly delicate. And there's a, a fine line or maybe not so fine line between trying to prevent terrible situations when there are police stops and communicating to a school filled with black and brown children, hey, you're likely to be stopped kids because that's how the world works and let me teach you how to not get shot, uh, which I could be rightly seen as somewhat um, offensive and undermining the community police relationship goal. So um, I'm not sure there are good studies on that, but I, I've definitely heard anecdotally um, concerns about that, those sorts of education programs. All right, so we have some uh, questionable evidence about the, about the value of SROs relative to their stated goals. Um, what about some of the potential downsides and what we refer to as mission creep? Well, I, I would, I think that was my phrase from, from an early email exchange with Julie, with you, Julie. Um, think back to those, the, the triad um, descriptors and the, some of what was just recorded descriptions of what SROs do. Uh, they're not super crisp about what what it is an SRO is supposed to do, right? Um, what is it? What's the line between being a counselor and the stuff described in sort of informal counselor? You can go all the way to being a surrogate parent figure. We've got people who so we've got SROs who are around in the school. They build relationships with kids. They're kind of in everything, or or and it's easy for that for something to happen, some pushing and shoving to happen in the school cafeteria, and then the um th then there the sro is right um, and that's what gets to concerns about sros engaging in school discipline and the school to prison pipeline that's one mechanism through through which relatively minor school misbehavior can become matters for arrests and charges when perhaps there's a better way to approach it the SROs being in the school having some amorphous lines around their role can lead to mission creep and them getting involved in school discipline and arresting kids for for, for that sort of thing. Uh, one, one way to think about uh, the mission creep problem is to think of the tools that are available to officers, uh, SROs, and how they're trained to use those tools. And for most officers, the uh, the one real tool that they have that they can use uh, even in light of other uh, people objecting to that tools, right? The non-consent based tool is arrest. It's the formal invocation of the criminal justice process. When you have a hammer, the old saying goes, every problem looks like a nail. And that can give rise to SROs uh, using that criminal justice authority in situations where or it may not be appropriate. And I can give you an example other uh, um, than a, a fight, but to, to leave us in the cafeteria that, that Josh mentioned, um, you could imagine uh, one child taking another child's lunch or part of their lunch. Um, that's uh, probably a relatively common um, uh, approach to uh, bullying. Um, it may even be in jest, uh, even though it may not be perceived as in jest. Um, but what we just described was 
a, a larceny. It was a theft, right? One kid took another kid's property. Um, instead of dealing with that as a, a disciplinary issue, uh, a potential bullying issue, uh, or just um, kids who are breaking formal social rules because, unsurprisingly, they're kids, uh, the SRO may invoke criminal justice authority there. The other aspect of mission creep isn't from it doesn't come from the SRO um, themselves, but from school uh, administrators and faculty members. Uh, a teacher who does not have access, or a school administration who does not have access to an SRO, may handle a particular incident as a school disciplinary matter, um, whereas if they have an SRO, they may start calling the SRO because, frankly, it can be much easier to call the officer and let them deal with it than to try and deal with uh, a classroom management issue using uh, the, the available disciplinary process. Um, so there are uh, a couple of different aspects of mission creep to, to uh, you know. Um, following up on what Seth just said, and sorry, Julie, if I'm getting off of our the order of our, of our slides, some of the, the highest profile exhibits of, of problematic uh, SRO behaviors involve, I think, everything that both Seth and I were, were just saying, where teachers and school administrators call in SROs to engage in school discipline, when SROs let themselves be pulled into school discipline, and then they turn it in to, um, to what you're seeing on the screen, school behavior as, as causes for arrest. And um, two examples, uh, which I think I went through, the, the screen went through very quickly that I, I like to point to are Ferguson, Missouri, and and the Spring Valley Science in here in Columbia that uh, that Julie mentioned earlier. In, in Ferguson, everyone knows, everyone knows what happened um, after Michael Brown's shooting in, in, in Ferguson. One of the less high profile pieces of that, the U.S. Department of Justice investigated the entire police department, including their the couple of SROs they had in the local school system. And they found that the SROs there were citing kids and sending them to juvenile court for, quote, failure to obey or, or, um, or failure to comply. They would, like a kid would be unruly in class, the teacher would kick them out, because they go to the office, go talk to the assistant principal, the SRO would be there just to make sure, and in this mission creep, just to make sure this doesn't get too dramatic. But you've got an angry teenager who just got kicked out of class. A good portion of them aren't going to do what the officer says either. Some of them are even going to cuss or be loud. And those are the kids who end up getting sent, instead of for a mental health referral or instead of just for school discipline, they get, end up getting got sent to um, to to juvenile court um, in uh, in St. Louis County from, from the Ferguson Police Department SROs, right? And the U.S. DOJ took them to task for this. Um, the Spring Valley High School incident, you all, if you're on this call, you have surely seen the video. That was one where the SRO pulled the, the teenage girl out of her desk and kind of threw her across the floor. Um, so it got it's high profile because of the excessive force that was used, right, uh, which led the sheriff to fire that SRO pretty quickly. But the way that that officer got in that classroom is exactly what we're talking about, right? The girl didn't put her that, yeah, there's the picture. Um, the girl didn't put her cell phone away. The teacher told her to put the cell phone away. She didn't do it. The teacher called the assistant principal. She was, by the way, not being loud or anything. The assistant principal told her she didn't do it. And then so then they called the SRO. He was just another stop in their progressive discipline chain. And then it led to, to that incident, right? And so there's a question, of course, about the, the force used, but also why he was there to begin with. And that goes two ways, right? He, he saw that as a legitimate role for him. He arrested her for disturbing schools, and the school saw that as a legitimate role for him. Which I think is a good um, segue to the next uh, topic, which is to talk about the um, concerns about disparate impact of SRO programs and, and how um, the various ways in which bias may enter into this discussion. If one of you wants to take off on that. Well, I'll start with point one, which I think is, is um, not, not necessarily the most obvious point, but if you, um, if you want to look at which schools have SROs, and I think at this point in our history, 
SROs are pretty embedded in the fabric of American schools, especially middle and high schools. Um, there are roughly 20,000 SROs by most counts around, although the counts are hard to get precise numbers around, around the country. Um, but not every school has them, right? And um, it's the, there's a, another law professor in, out of Florida who's done a number of studies about where SROs are most likely to be placed. And so SROs are, and he found, perhaps unsurprisingly, that schools with high African-American populations are more likely than other schools to have SROs assigned to them, even controlling for things like crime rates in the neighborhood or, or, or income in the neighborhood. Race uh, correlates with where SROs are. So if we have a concern about SROs presence leading to more arrests for minor school misbehavior and SROs are more likely present in high African-American population schools, you can it, it, you piece it together to more black kids getting arrested for relatively minor misbehavior. Um, the other pieces I'll, I'll throw out there um, that, that that scholar found is urban schools and southern schools in particular um, are particularly more likely controlling for crime rates and other such things uh, to have SROs and other strict security measures in, in, in their schools. And, the, and then, uh, Seth, if you want to talk about so, um, some of the ways in which bias shows up in, in what we've been talking about in terms of how likely an administrator is to call in the SRO to handle what might otherwise be seen as a discipline issue. Do we have some studies that talk about that? Did we lose Seth, Josh? Um, I cannot tell, but I'm happy to try to answer that. And okay. Seth can come up when, he, when he's you know, there. And there are a lot of studies about implicit bias, right? Which is, as I probably don't need to define that that phrase, but just, just just in case, I mean, explicit bias is when someone consciously thinks I don't like X group, I'm going to look for someone in that group to do something negative to. Implicit bias is much less conscious and is I think reflects a much larger portion of uh, mo you know uh, racial disparities in, in 2018. You see two kids doing similar behaviors in different settings. In the aggregate, there's been a number of studies about both educators and police officers are more likely to treat black kids' behavior more punitively. They're more likely to see a black kid doing the same thing as a white kid as more physically threatening or more violent. Um, there's been a number of, and this is, 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 this is racialized, it is gendered. There's been a number of studies about how black girls of the same age as white girls are seen as more sexually experienced and more sexually knowledgeable than, than white girls are without having any details about any situations. Um, and there's a lot of data about how, how with, with boys, um, black boys are seen as older and bigger and more physically threatening um, than, um, than, than, than white boys. And, and the illustration that is, resonates with me, it's outside of schools in the SRO context, but Tamir Rice, the boy who was shot in, uh, I believe, a Cleveland Park, the 911 caller, he was like 12 or 13, 911 caller said that, that, that she thought he was 18 or 20 and was older and bigger than he was, right? Um, the one point I would emphasize is I'm not sure that SRO's implicit bias difficulties are any worse than anyone else's, right? If they're, they're in a cafeteria and they see kids pushing and shoving, they've got to decide whether to intervene and if so, how. It's just, Split second decision. Would I expect implicit bias to show up? Yeah, I would. I would expect it to show up if I were in that situation, or if I, or teachers in the aggregate were, were were in that situation. Are there ways in which uh, we can compensate for the risks and the downsides of um, some of the risks and downsides that we've talked about, including the disparate impact? While, while attempting to preserve some of the benefits of having officers in schools. Um, absolutely, and there, there's been a lot of reforms in this area over the last, I'd say in the 2010s. Um, there's been federal guidance from the Obama administration, but not yet um, rescinded. Um, there's been 
a number of state laws and state regs and local MOUs, memorandums of agreement between local law enforcement and school districts um, on these issues. Uh, and it all gets to the same point, so, um, the, which is to try to limit the SRO's role. So if we're concerned about mission creep and in particular mission creep into a place where SROs are getting involved in school discipline and arresting kids for what, what may be technically a crime but doesn't really need to be in juvenile court, there can be limits. And the, the gist of all those reforms is to say, SROs, your, your primary role here is law enforcement. SROs, you are not here to do school discipline, right? So if you've got a kid who's not putting her cell phone away, calling the SRO is not part of the progressive discipline plan. If you've got a kid who's going to the principal's office, that doesn't need to be a failure to comply sort of issue. And then if you look at those, those two, two examples, there's now a federal consent decree in Ferguson, Missouri to reform the Ferguson Police Department. One of its elements is to limit SRO involvement in school discipline to avoid those failure to comply charges. And, and the consent decree has some language about basically when things get serious enough to involve um, SROs. There's been similar reforms here in South Carolina. There's a new state regulation that you know, tells school districts, you can have SROs, but you gotta have an MOU, and that MOU's gotta have some limits that explain how, how we're gonna keep the SROs out uh, of school discipline. Right? Um, that's, so, so that's one piece. Uh, just, I, I will, uh, oh, go ahead. I was just gonna ask whether you know, some of those um, Guide, the federal guidance and the MOUs, if there are requirements about training both to SROs and to school staff on, on you know, how to handle these issues and, and particularly with, you know, some of the particular concerns that we talked about in terms of yeah, kids. So Go ahead. Um, so short answer is, is yes. Um, MOUs, I mean, these are essentially contracts between two government agencies and they tend not to be too detailed about training requirements, although they the training requirements have come out in, in other contexts. So there was a, I won't get lost in the legal jargon, I promise, but there's a voluntary agreement between the local sheriff's department here in Columbia, South Carolina, which supplies most of the SROs and the US Department of Justice. They, and there are a lot of training requirements in there that was agreed to after the Spring Valley um, incident. And, and a lot of the training reflects some of the particular needs of kids with who have mental health conditions, children who have disabilities, children who have trauma histories, and if you're talking about the kids who are um, exhibiting troublesome behaviors in school, and especially those who are committing crimes at school, there's a there huge dis, hugely disproportionate numbers of those kids have mental health conditions and trauma histories and other, and various other um, disabilities. And so what, one of the things that uh, to give a case example that always frustrates me um, is you've got a high school kid who who is flipping out. They're they're pissed off at somebody, right? They got kicked out of their class. They're getting suspended for something. They are angry, and someone tries to calm them down. And the SRO says, "I either I'm the police officer. I'm going to calm this guy down because he's going if he's going to listen to anyone, he's going to listen to me. Or maybe they've tried to be a counselor to this kid." and they think they have a relation, they think they particularly can help, help him calm down. So they come up to him and put their hand on his shoulder and say, son, you got to calm down. And you got a kid who's really riled up and angry. And the next thing is he jerks around or pushes the officer off of him. And now he's facing a charge of assaulting an officer. Um, that's the sort of case pattern that drives me batty because if you've got a kid who's acting that way, there's a good chance they've got a mental health condition, a good chance they have a trauma history. And the last thing you want to do with someone in that situation is really get in their physical space and physically touch them in, unless you tr truly need to, right? That's going to uh, very often trigger a response that can be accurately described as an assault on an officer, but if the officer handled the situation differently, wouldn't get to that point. So there's been, so here in Richland County, especially since the, the um, the Spring Valley incident, our local sheriff's department, to its credit, has done a lot of training of its SROs about um, children with disabilities. They have a, a, a policy for you know, now for the first time for handling kids with disabilities. They train their SROs on adverse childhood experiences. If that's a new phrase to you, please, when this is over, Google the phrase adverse childhood experiences. 
this. Um, you learn tremendous, tremendous thing. I mean, when you bad things that happen when you're young have long, very long-lasting impacts on on individuals' behavior, and it, and it should inform how we respond to kids in those situations. I, I'm going to interrupt Josh, and, and there was a question that came in regarding um, particular training standards and recommendations for SROs. Um, including a lot of the things that, that you've been talking about. Do you know of um, any sort of written guidelines that are out there um, for how to, how to train on these issues that you could direct our listeners to? So, um, NASRO, the National Association of School Resource Officers, um, has what I think is some pretty good training. Now, um, NASRO is going to be more positive on the role of SROs than you've heard me be so far. Um, I, it won't surprise anyone that by at this point um, that I'm a little skeptical of their role in, in schools. NASRO, it's the association of SROs. They're going to be more positive, but they do recognize, I think, the issues we're describing and um, have some training programs around them. And there's also some, and I can share this with you, uh, Julie, later, um, there are some model MOUs that, again, the Obama administration put, put together um, that tried to identify, try, tried to work towards some of these same issues um, as, as well, and I can send you a link to that. Great, thanks. Um, another question that came in that sort of goes to this slide about minimizing risks and preserving um, some of the benefits has to do with um, selection of, MR, M, of SROs. and the extent to which um, any of these, uh, any of the guide, the guidance that we've talked about touches on that in terms of how do you go about selecting the right person? Because that seems to be, uh, in, in our experience with this, really key. Um, you know, having, having an officer who has the right kind of temperament and demeanor and, and motivation is really key to this. So do any of these um, guidelines touch on the selection process? Yes, um, a lot of good MOUs do talk about the selection process. Um, as the question indicates, right, this being an SRO is different than being a, a other, another type of police officer. There's no question about that and you want to be selecting well. You don't want someone who thinks it's the, the school beat, right? It's different. Um, mo some of the best model MOUs, like that document I just mentioned that, that I'll send you later, do, do have provisions about this. They also have provisions for how schools and law enforcement agencies can troubleshoot problems, right? Because if an SRO isn't working out, right? Or um, how, how do you, you know, who, how do you flag that, right? And there, there are provisions for, you know, usually there are different structures in different uh, localities. You, the most common structure is an SRO is, is a uniformed employee of the local law enforcement agency, right there. So they don't formally answer to the school principal, right? Because uh, their paycheck is from the sheriff or from the, the, the local law enforcement agencies, but there's gotta be a mechanism for feedback. I mean, there's gotta be a good supervision structure that gathers feedback from, from people outside of the law enforcement agency who see the, the SRO day to day. That, those are important uh, features uh, of a good system. And then there are also some internal structures, and I know you've already touched on some of these, um, to limit these um, concerns about the school to prison pipeline and how those, um, this also hits on a couple of the questions I've seen come up on the screen about um, other partners in the juvenile justice system and how, you know, what their role is in this and how they can weigh in um, on these issues. Yes, yeah, so, well, I'll list a couple of things and, and cut me off any time. Number, number one, um, I think a good example is, again is here in Richland County, South Carolina, where, where Columbia is, post Spring Valley, one of their reforms is that they, one of their supervisors in their SRO division meets with all individual officers, not every day or every week, but I think, I think it's every month, uh, certainly no less frequent than every quarter, about every, and they review individually every single arrest that an SRO has made with the goal of saying, was there an alternative to an arrest in this case? Right? It both creates a little bit of a deterrent on the officer, right? like and maybe a stop and think, can I justify this to my supervisor, right, if I'm going to 
the rest of, of kids, and it helps build a culture of let's find alternatives to arrests. Right? Um, that can, those sorts of mechanisms can do a lot of good. Um, for what it's worth, the number of arrests at school by the SRO unit uh, has been cut roughly in half in the last couple of years uh, since the Spring Valley incident here in Columbia. Um, so that's one piece. You, there's also the question about um, other players in the juvenile justice system. So I would look at prosecutors and whoever does intake. Intake o operates differently in different states and different localities. Sometimes there's a probation department or a department of juvenile justice that's involved. If you're getting, if kids are, for instance, being charged with you know, failure to comply and disturbing schools and some of these other offenses, that doesn't have to be prosecuted, right? There's a place in the process for those cases to be screened out for someone to say, you know what, this should be a school discipline matter, not a law enforcement and juvenile court matter. So I do think there is a role uh, for prosecutors and probation intake officers there. Um, and, and there's, um, and there are ways, it, it takes a lot of time if you can bring prosecutors and departments of juvenile justice, probation offices and schools all together to try to get, you know, set protocols for what types of cases absolutely need to be prosecuted, which types of cases really shouldn't be, when do we send kids off to diversion, give them a second or third chance before we prosecute them for a particular type of behavior. Um, Clayton County, one of the suburbs of Atlanta, has a, what's been shown as to be one of the, the model, um, model protocols like that around, around the country. If you, if you Google uh, Clayton County Cooperative Agreement, you will, will, you will find that pretty quickly. Um, and and then, I think you also then, mentioned Oh, go ahead. I was just going to follow up with an, another question that, that came up on my screen um, about the juvenile justice partners. And have you seen, are there any jurisdictions where um, the law enforcement agency in, in making an assessment of individual SRO performance has looked to uh, prosecutors or uh, other juvenile justice partners to um, help in that assessment? I'm not, not aware of, of, of that. I know, again, of, of MOUs that say, you know, school staff should have a view, uh, so law enforcement agency staff, and, and you know, there, there's the example I gave of, of law enforcement supervisors kind of really trying to figure out, do you need to arrest this kid? I'm not aware of prosecutors or, or departments of juvenile justice or, or public defenders um, being invited to do the same, at least on an individual basis. I know lawyer, defense lawyers and prosecutors can raise concerns about it kind of less formally uh, saying, hey, we just got this case. What, what did your officer do? Like, we can do that. Um, but I've never heard of, hey, officer, officer Smith is up for review. Do you have any feedback? Um, that I'm not aware of. And then one uh, bit of training we didn't talk about, and maybe we don't need to belabor it, but um, is is training to overcome some of the implicit bias issues that we talked about. But also, if you could talk about the good um, about data tracking and right. and who's doing a good job of this, and and what the keys are to that. Um, so who's doing a good job is a harder question to answer. Um, but if you if you and this is a point that goes beyond SROs. Um, in virtually any settlement that DOJ has reached with local law enforcement agencies, good data tracking has been a key piece of it. And it's certainly true in school discipline matters and, and, and the, the role of SROs. If there's one or two schools in a school district that are seeing much higher numbers, much higher arrest rates than other schools, maybe the kids are much worse behaved there maybe it has something to do with the authority's response in those schools. Same with school suspension data. And you can individualize this. I mean, we, we live in a world where keeping, if you enter good data, you can, it be, can become a very powerful tool, right? You can say to Officer Smith in his supervision meeting, you know, you've got a similar, you're at a school with very similar demographics to Officer Jones, but turns out that you're arresting more kids and or the racial breakdown of the kids you're arresting is different. You can have that conversation if you have really good data. 
um, and if the departments invest in in analyzing it. Um, there's got to be a commitment to tracking that data. Um, that can also lead to good public democratic oversight, little d democratic oversight, right? Local department publishes that data, that's a good thing, right? And and folks like local civilian uh, law enforcement oversight boards can look at that data and, and try to see systemically if there's some sort of problem or, if there's, or hopefully that there's a lot of progress. Uh, so speaking about the money question, um, many critics say school districts would be better off spending money on an increased number of social workers or perhaps um, therapists rather than paying the high price of having law enforcement officers on campus. And I was just uh, wondering what your view is on that and if you could flesh out those arguments. Sure. So I, I, mean, I like the way you, you, you phrased the, the question. It implies a cost-benefit analysis, right? Um, so we've got to ask, you know, we've got to define our goals, right? We should figure out what, what it is that we want an SRO to do, and then what's the most cost-effective way to do it? So going back to the triad, right? If we want, if and, and, and the mechanisms of achieving the, those goals. So going back to the triad, if we want to emphasize a law enforcement role, we want some, let's say, we know it's hard to prove empirically, but we think we can deter some school shooters if by having a police officer on campus, Part of it, we're going to emphasize their their goal and deter you know more, more less sensational crimes as well. We're going to make that a visible person. We're going to have them do security sweeps several several times a day. We're going to, if that's your goal, that's, and that's your mechanism. Okay, that's going to be an SRO. A therapist can't do that. If your goal is we think we need to have good relationships, we 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 have kids with troubled family backgrounds, etc. We need people who can really build good relationships with them. We've got kids who have some mental health conditions, trauma histories, et cetera. We, we think positive relationships will help. Where you probably won't surprise anyone that I, I would, if that's your goal, I would think that therapists and social workers are going to be more effective at achieving that goal. They're certainly better trained to achieve that goal than a lot of law enforcement officers. Um, I also think that if, when you look at juvenile crime as a whole, you look at the kids who are repeat behave, bad behavior causers at, in, in school. You look at kids who come into juvenile court, an overwhelming number of them have unaddressed mental health issues. They've got trauma histories. We need to find services to address those underlying causes. I, I'd much rather do that in the first instance through a social worker at school who can look at a history of bad behavior and say, we need to get this kid some services, than to have an SRO build a relationship. And what's the, what's the SRO's toolkit, especially if there's no social worker at school, their toolkit is let's bring them into juvenile court, it's a rehabilitative model, we'll get those services. There's a lot of research that shows once you bring kids into juvenile court, you're increasing the likelihood they're going to come back. So I'd much rather get those same services for kids through a school social worker. Last point I'll say on this, I think we ask way too much of our law enforcement, right? We ask that we ask law enforcement to deal with children and adults too who have severe mental health conditions. And they're stuck with dealing with kids with severe mental health conditions in part because we haven't invested in mental health services for those same kids. And that gets back to a cost benefit analysis. So would you, are we, is it worth it to spend a million dollars on two SROs in every high school in a particular school district? Can, is there a better way to allocate that money? Um, that Those are important conversations to have. It's important to have those dollar figures out there to inform those conversations. Um, and then each school district you know, will, will, will make its own call. I, I want to get keep us moving because we've got a lot of questions coming in. I think the uh, the practical reality here is uh, we're not going to get SROs out of schools. Um, so a lot of the issues that we've talked about, the training um, and all of that's important. And I, I kind of want to I want to buzz through this slide because I want to get to the to this last slide, um, which I think is important given that this is a NACL webinar, and that is 
what is the role of civilian oversight and what, you know, how can communities become involved in these issues? And I think we talked uh, a lot about the, the different ways um, that you can, that communities can be, uh, can weigh in. But I wanted to just cover some of these points and get any other views that you have. Um, so if you want to, you want to take us through these, this slide, and then I want to save a few minutes for, uh, like I said, we've got a lot of questions here. Sure. So, so I won't repeat things that I've already said. So um, civil, civilian oversight boards can and should be familiar with MOUs. Contracts between public agencies or public documents, there should be no issue whatsoever getting it. And if any, any agency gives you an issue, you should just FOIA, use your freedom of information law to re request those, those documents. They should explain the roles of an SRO and any limits on those roles. Not every locality will have very clearly defined limits, but where they exist, they're helpful to know. So that if you're evaluating, say something like the Spring Valley incident, you're not just looking at the excessive force used, but you're looking at whether that SRO should have been there in the first place. That's part. That's a big part of part of the um, the the equation. Talk with stakeholders. Talk to your local public defenders. By definition, public defenders are going to give you a cynical view of anything the state does to their client that's their job um, but if, so they won't be shy um, in, in my experience about sharing general concerns about um, SRO's involvement with their with their clients a lot of juvenile prosecutors won't be shy either at least off the record or when they're not talking about an individual case same thing with departments of juvenile justice so, so I work um, with them um, I'll stop for, for questions I'm conscious of time too okay um, let me, let me go through. I, I, I've tried to pick apart some of these questions and, and either ask you about them or address them as we've gone, but, uh, I want to go back, um, and, and specifically ask some of the questions that have come in. And I apologize, uh, if, if I don't, if I've, if I don't get to a particular point that someone wanted to make, uh, I'm hoping Cami can tell us at the end of this, um, how, uh, how we can, if, if people want to have some ongoing um, communication with Josh or Seth or me on this issue, I, I'm hoping we can figure out how to do that. Um, this one came in early. Are, uh, do you think that having SROs are an effective pushback to the concept of arming teachers and staff at schools that have that 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 has risen as an art as a um, possibility after some of these recent school shootings? Um, I take an armed police officer over armed teachers, but <laughs> as a professor and a parent, um, so that's the short answer. So I guess that's a yes. Although I would hope that we could frame the question in a what I think is a, a more helpful way of if we want to keep our schools safe, what's the most effective tool to do that, and then how does that how should that affect the role and constrain the role of police officers? If we're really assigning police officers to school to prevent school shootings, then we've got to have a hard conversation about whether they're going to be involved in education and counseling and who else might be. And, and be clear about that and use that to help keep, avoid some of that mission creep. So in some ways, that, that's the, bet, the most positive scenario I, I hear from that sort of, sort of question. Have you seen any places, uh, this was another question that came in, uh, where students and parents are regularly solicited for feedback on the effectiveness of the SRO program? Oh, that's a, um, <clears throat> that's a great question. So there have been a couple um, examples where a lot of community activists have been involved. Denver Public Schools, for instance, is a leading example uh, of this, where there's a lot of local activism, which led to, to some reforms. A lot of, frankly, our, of our big urban school districts that have had a lot of positive reforms uh, regarding school discipline and, and, uh, and their SRO programs over the years. Denver is the example that comes to mind where there is this very prominent role of, 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 for local um, activists. I'm not familiar, and let's not say it doesn't exist somewhere, but I'm not familiar with a kind of more formal, built-in, let's bring community members in to reviewing um, reviewing SRO program. I, I, I slightly take that back. Here, here in Columbia, part of the how our local sheriff's department re dealt with um, 
the fall from the Spring Valley incident, they, they did put together a community panel, but it was sort of a, it was like a hand-selected panel. Okay. Um, what I would say though, if, if someone wants to have a conversation of like the cost benefit analysis, if you want to say we're spending too much or we're spending not enough on, on SROs, a lot of that is decided at your local school board, right? And so you get three people to show up at a school board meeting, that'll be three times as many as probably showed up at the last one, and you can make a big difference. Uh, another question, what are the liability issues regarding having either having or not having SROs in the school? Sure. Um, so I don't think there is much liability risk in not having an SRO. I suppose then if something terrible happened, someone could sue and say you should have, it would be negligent to do that. There may be a divergence uh, to, to negligence to not have a, an SRO at, at school. SROs are very common. They're embedded in our, in our school fabric, but there are lots of schools that don't have them. I don't think we're at the place where as a matter of a like tort law or negligence law, we can say a reasonably prudent school district has to have a, some sort of security a, a, um, a, apparatus. Um, that's especially true if the school district has given some thought to the matter and they have some kind of security protocol. Maybe they've gotten a security guard instead of an SRO. Maybe they've instituted more locked doors and put bulletproof glass on some way or done whatever else they, they might do. Um, they, they have a hard time seeing liability there. Is there liability if an SRO does something? Oh yeah, when a, just like uh, police departments get sued when there's excessive force allegations on the street, school dis or sorry, uh, uh, police departments and school districts can and have been sued when, um, when there have been excessive force allegations at school. And I would say if, if either the school or the law enforcement have been negligent in enforcing or supervising their own MOUs, then that's going to make for a harder to defend scenario. If a police officer gets involved in a school discipline and there's an MOU that says don't get involved in, school, in a school disciplinary incident, and then there's an excessive force allegation, I would think that might lead to a quick settlement. Right. Okay, another question. Um, you mentioned that excessive reliance of, on SROs in dealing with disciplinary issues in schools might lead to a school to prison pipeline. Are there studies or evidence which suggest that this does occur? I guess, we're, I guess the, the question goes to, are there you know, specific studies that you could point to um, as a reference for this? Um, yes. Um, there have been a number of studies that show the, the presence of SROs increases the number of arrests for relatively minor offenses. Um, I don't think there's much reason to, to think, and this gets back to a point Seth was making earlier, I'm not sure there's, there's much reason to think that having an SRO present will increase the actual uh, crime rate, but because the SRO is there, they're going to arrest more. Just like people speed down the highway if an officer, if a state trooper is not there, but there'll be more tickets issued if you station a state trooper there. Right? And so, so it, and that leads to a policy question of do we want to be arresting the, the, these kids? Um, a, a resource I'd point to, uh, the ABA, the American Bar Association, put together a, a pretty good report uh, a year or two ago on the school to prison pipeline, identifying its various causes, one of which is the role of, of, of SROs. Okay. Uh, two more questions, it looks like. Um, one is, um, whether the performance of SROs is assessed annually. Um, I, I'm, my guess is the answer there it has to do with each uh, law enforcement agency's own um, assessment process and review process. But, it, but the follow-up to that question was, if so, is there a rubric designed to assess uh, SRO performance? Um, so definitely, yes, it, it varies, with, with, varies by locality. Yes, there um, there are some localities that do require you know an annual um, re reviews. There's certain you know with the school year cycle, it's sort of a natural thing anyway, and you should reevaluate you know whether a particular school assignment is working out. Um, in terms of a rubric, um, there's surely rubrics out there. I am not identifying off the top of my head a model rubric. Um, that, that sort of 
been endorsed or presented um, as such. I'd have to go back to that document, which I promised now a couple of times to give to you, Julie. Uh, but whether those, those model MOUs include any rubrics for measuring SRO, S, individual SRO performance. Okay. And last question. Um, somebody asked whether you, you recommend any, any particular books or literature that address these issues. And the asker noted that the book called Help for Billy by Heather Forbes is, she, uh, is an excellent resource. Um, to help kids beyond the negative consequences uh, and helping children through uh, through relationship building, um, I just I, I thought I would end it with asking: Are there any particular uh, anything on your reading list that you would recommend um, that uh, folks, folks interested in this topic take a look at? Uh, yeah. The um, my reading list tends to be denser than. And I typically, um, than, than I typically re recommend. Um, he, what I, what I, I, if you want a clear, a clear and reasonably concise description of a lot of these issues that I think is reasonably level-headed, there I'll, and I can also send this to you, Julie. The ABA they called it their preliminary report on the school to prison pipeline. It's like 60 or 70 pages. It's a policy white paper. It's not thrilling reading but it pretty clearly and succinctly summarizes the different threads that, that contribute to what's called the pipeline. Great. Josh, thank you so much. Um, Seth, I, I don't, I'm, I, thank you to you too if you're out there listening somehow and I apologize that we lost our connection. Uh, Cami, it looks like we're at the end of our hour, so I wanted to turn it back to you. Thank you, Julie, and thank you. Um, to Josh and Seth for providing the information to us today. I want to thank everyone for attending today's session and for taking a moment to complete the online survey that will be sent to you shortly. We're currently finalizing our next webinars in our 2018 series, so please stay tuned for additional details and registration information. In the meantime, we hope that you'll visit the NACOL website at NACOL.org for information on our annual training conference that will be taking place this September. 30th through October 4th in St. Petersburg, Florida. And we'll look for information for our next regional conference, which will be held in Cleveland, Ohio on November 30th. Once again, I thank you for joining us today and we look forward to having you at our future NACOL training opportunities. Thank you.